so kind with me as you remain standing. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As you find that passage of scripture, you will find these words printed there, starting at verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he shall still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that many thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. I want to stop right there this morning and talk to you from this thought, our living hope. You may be seated. Our living hope. Living hope. The power which the Apostle Paul aims to equip these struggling saints is the power of living hope. If they or we are going to live and love like Jesus commands us, even in times of great stress and worry, then they and we must be filled with living hope. Many of Paul's letters have been called the gospel of hope. A great characteristic of the Christian life is that we live in hope. Christian hope it sustains us in the midst of difficulties. For hope is born out of full confidence, belief, and trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Living in the light and life of Jesus' resurrection does not exempt us from life's evil, ills, and temptations. Amen. Yet resurrection hope does diminish the debilitating power of distressing trials. We thus can not only endure, but live victoriously as we experience the life and joy of Christ, which is a foretaste of glory divine. The living Christ is the source of our new birth, of our living hope. If you have a living hope in the living Christ, you can deal with your past failures, your present difficulties, because, you, your, because of your future blessings. Amen. God's glorious best for you lies ahead. Yes. Pardon me as I repeat that. God's glorious best for you lies ahead. Amen. Somebody still didn't hear that. Amen. Amen. I can say a little bit louder. God's glorious best for you lies ahead. Amen. Sound like hope to me. Just anticipating what God has in store for us can release joy yes. in our souls and put a smile on our face. Amen. Just anticipating That's right. what God has in store for us can and should release joy in our souls and put a smile on our face. Yeah. Hope gives us confidence and lets us live with the inner strength. <laughs> For we know that one day we will be radically different than we are right now. Yes. I like that. Yes. We're going to be radically different than we are right now. Things may not look that good right now. But, it, but hope is not always going to stay that way. But it's not just any kind of stagnant hope. It's a living hope in a living, resurrected Christ. It's not just in a promise. It's in he who made the promise. A living hope. The Christmas season ought to remind us that our hope is, in fact, alive. 
it is generally activated through, first of all, intensity of despair. Mm -hmm. Intensity of despair. Mm. Paul describes in verse 8 a devastating hardship in which he received God's comfort and God's empowering grace. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brother, of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life itself, is what Paul is saying. Paul now lays down the theology of affliction and he cites a specific illustration in his own recent experience. Evidently, the Corinthian Christians were aware of what this event Paul was describing, but we're not. But they were not aware of the intensity of the trouble and of the affliction that Paul and his group were going through. Paul doesn't tell them what it was. But he tells them how oppressed he was beyond endurance. Yeah. Yeah. Paul and his traveling companions had a trial so severe that they were weighted down beyond their own power. Mm. Paul, Paul, Paul was being oppressed and hemmed in by afflictions of such magnitude that apart, of the, apart from divine intervention, he could not hope to survive it. <laughs> they were in such intense uh, despair that they said that they lost all hope even of life itself literally we have no way out of life even to live they believed that they would not survive this affliction that they were facing when most of us grew up as kids we used to jokingly quote shakespeare we used to go around and say to be or not to be not to be yeah. that's the question yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we really didn't understand what it meant. Later on in life, many of us learned that Shakespeare's character Hamlet, <laughs> who spoke these lines, was a desperate prince who learned that his uncle had killed his father and married his mother. <laughs> the horror of the revelation was so disturbing that he contemplated suicide. The question was, to be, well, should I go on living, to be, or not to be, should I take my own life? At times, life's pain can be so overwhelming and become so overwhelming that we are tempted to despair life itself. <coughs> Have you ever had a trial too great to bear? Have you ever had to endure something that you just wish wouldn't be? You need to know something this morning. You're in good company. God has allowed many of the choicest servants of God to go through the fiery furnace of affliction. Paul said that his persecution in Asia was so intense that he despised even that of life itself. But we must hasten to remember that this is the same Paul who writes a couple of chapters later in this same book in the fourth chapter, starting in verse 7, he says, but we have this treasure in earthly vessels. Yeah. He, 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 he's not just speaking some theological words that maybe he heard somebody else talk about. He says, we have this treasure in earthly vessels, in our own body, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. He's speaking out of his own personal experience. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Amen. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. That's right. Struck down, but not destroyed. Sound like hope to me. Amen. Always carrying about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our own bodies. Sound like hope to me. For we who live and are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. The same Paul who had a devastating experience in life said it didn't end that way for him. But God stepped in. And as the old folks said, made a way out of no way. Sound like hope to me. Our living hope is also activated by our intensity of trust. Our intensity of trust. Mm. Verse 9 of our text says, Yes, 
we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. Now, I discovered that there are only three possible outlooks a person can take when they come to the afflicting trials of life. There's only three, basically. First of all, if we believe our trials are the product of fate or chance, then we might as well just give up right now, for they are unalterable. <laughs> Nobody can control fate or chance. Secondly, if we believe we have to control everything ourselves, mm. then the situation is equally hopeless since there are some things we just can't control in life. Amen. But thirdly, but if we believe God is in control yes. and we trust him, then we can overcome circumstances and the debilitating hopelessness through his help. It is God who continually encourages us in our tribulations by teaching us from his word that he is, amen, who permits trials to come into our lives in the first place. Yeah. If we're going to pray to God, we're praying, believing he's got the power to turn our situations around. But it's not, it's not the truth that if he has the power to turn it around, didn't he have the power to prevent it in the first place? Otherwise, why pray to him? But if he doesn't have the power to turn it around, then he didn't have the power to prevent it in the first place. <laughs> but God wants us to know that, hear me clearly, I didn't say God causes the trouble. But I say God allows the trouble to come into our life. Yes. God allows it through either his permissive will or his divine will, but he looks down through the trouble and says, you can handle that one right there. Amen. It may not feel good to you. You may not like going through it, but, but you're going to have to go through that one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in verse 9, we learn, I said we learn something here, <laughs> that God sometimes allows trials. So that we might not listen to that, that we might not rely on ourselves, but learn once again to rely on Him. You see, as long as I got a little money in my checkbook and I can go down here to Vons or Food Max or Superstore Walmart and do my grocery shopping, hey amen. I may not even pray before I go in the grocery store. I'm fully relying on my checkbook to pick up anything I want to pick up. <laughs> Sit down to pay my bills. As long as I know I worked all my long, surely there'll be enough money to pay my bills. I'm no longer relying on God. I'm relying on myself that I made good choices and I'm doing the right thing. Yes, Paul said, here I am. I am. I'm the one God chose and God is using me to write three quarters of the New Testament. Yes, I find myself in a situation. Yes, and we have the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul was conscious within himself that he was a man upon, humanly speaking, the sentence of death was passed. But he believed God was still on his throne. I received the sentence of death, but I still believe that God is on his throne. I hear man on his throne saying, you're going to die. But I know that my God, who has the last word? Somebody said, let me say it politely, the hefty, it's not over until the hefty woman says it's over. Well, I want you to know something, it's not over until God says it's over. Says it's over. Sound like hope to me. He believed that God was still on his throne and God knew exactly how much burden he could take. And how much affliction he needed to bring about the growth outcome that God desired for his life. In other words, God allowed it not just to put me down, not just to run me down, not just to look over and wag his finger in my face. Didn't I tell you not to do things like that? No, 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 no. God says, I'm going to use this situation to bring you closer to myself. I'm going to use this situation 
to make you learn how to rely on me once again. It's amazing how your prayer life changes when you find yourself yes. in a situation yes. where you cannot help yourself. This dreadful trial was allowed in order to provide a precious spiritual lesson. The greatest lesson of this overwhelming affliction which had befallen him was that he and all of us who are followers of Christ should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. <laughs> I love why he keeps tagging that, who, who raises the dead. Uh, not just any kind of God, it, it, who, who raises the dead. It, uh, having a living hope in a person, not just promise, but who can raise the dead. Paul believed that they would die forcing him to admit that he could not handle the situation and must cast himself completely upon God's power to raise him up out of death. Then the greatest blessing of all came as he transferred looking into death. He had no choice but to transfer all his trust to the living God. Yeah. Believing that even though he would die, yeah. God could raise him from the dead. <laughs> Man may take my life as he knows, but my trust, my belief, my hope is in the living God who can raise the dead. So go ahead and take your best shot. And I may die, show up die. But the same God that raised his own son has the same power to raise me back up again. Sound like a good place for my hope. Abraham, Abraham was forced to this same place when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar of sacrifice. I, Isaac wasn't a little bitty boy like you see on the cartoon. <laughs> He, 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 he was big enough on, and strong enough to break away from Father Abraham if he wanted to. Yeah. Father, I see the wood. Yeah. I, I, I see the lamb. Uh, I mean, I don't see the lamb. I see the wood. Uh, I see the fire. But where's the sacrifice? <laughs> God will provide. I got hope yeah. that God will provide. Yes, but what I'm not going to tell you, Isaac, even if God allows you to burn up, I got faith, I got hope in the same God that he raised your life right up off that altar. Have you ever been in a place like that? <laughs> that you may be facing death itself, but I got hope that a God can resurrect it. They and so many others have cast all their hopes for life on the God who raises the dead. The same God who could raise Christ from the dead could also resurrect Paul out of his sentence of death. We too may face overwhelming dangers today. It could be serious illness. It could be financial bankruptcy. It could be a massive satanic attack, a major health crisis, or even severe persecution. But when God's children are in the fiery furnace, hear this good, God keeps his hand on the thermostat. Amen. He keeps his eye on the thermometer. He knows just how hot it is, even though you may not think so. Amen. You, you're hot and you're burning up, but God says, I know just how hot it is. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 bears that out where he says, Amen. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. In other words, he knows just how much I can bear. I may not realize how much I can bear, but God says, you can take a little bit more. No, no, Father God is hot enough. No, you can take a little bit more. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but, but with the temptation will make also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. God has a way out of the situation. 
He knows that he allows you to go into it, but he's already got an exit plan for the situation. But sometimes you got to go through it in order to get to where he wants you to get. I've been declaring over the last 20 years, we should sing a song that God is a bridge over troubled water. Beautiful song, beautiful lyrics. It's just a little problem with it. God is not always a bridge over troubled waters. Sometimes you got to go through the troubled waters to get to the other side. Sometimes you got to get wet. Sometimes you got to get cold. Sometimes you're going to feel lonely. But you got to go through those troubled waters to get to the other side. Sound like hope to me. One woman was filled with terror when she received a call from her doctor that he had discovered an irregularity in her mammogram. She immediately imagined the worst, cancer. She stopped by her church, numb and alarmed on her way to her appointment with the doctor. She saw these words inscribed above the door entrance. The same father who cares for you today will take care of you tomorrow Amen. and every day. Amen. Either he will shield you from suffering or he will give you strength to bear it. Amen. Be at peace Amen. and put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginations. Amen. Is not not the work of worry, anxious thoughts and imaginations? I'm thinking, I'm imagining the worst that could happen. Amen. As opposed to putting my trust, uh -huh. an intensity of trust in Almighty God and believing God for the best, even if death come itself, that God can raise that which has been dead. Those words which she had never noticed before helped her tremendously. Up to that point, she said, everything was turbulent. She said, now I release everything into God's hands. Of course God wants me to keep on keeping on. Amen. Sound like hope. Mm -hmm. Now Paul wasn't facing cancer, but his troubles were so great that he despaired even of life. We must learn, as Paul did, where to find help when life-threatening burdens of suffering weigh us down. One writer puts it this way, despair, despair is dispelled when you trust in God. Afflictions on the good will fall, but God keeps us safe through all. And though he may not spare us pain, his strength and grace becomes our gain. Did you know God uses impossible situations to prove himself real? and trustworthy to all of us. God wants us to trust him, not our gifts, our abilities, our experiences, our, our, our spiritual reserves, or our fortitude, and whatever we bring to the process. Listen, he looks at that stuff and he laughs. Put your trust in God, our living hope. In addition, our living hope is also activated by, thirdly, what? Well, intensity of hope. Mm. Intensity of hope. Verse 10 reminds us that God who comforts can also deliver. Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he still delivers us. Paul's rescue from certain death was by God's hand. This time God chose to deliver them by granting continual life. Sometimes he allows us to be delivered into eternal life itself. Having experienced God's deliverance in this dire situation infused Paul with confidence that the God in whom he trusted could also deliver him in the present and future circumstances. So Paul has learned to face the future and even death without fear. For all now is in what? God's hands. Paul learned. He learned to face the future and even death without fear. For now it's all in God's hands. He realized it's not about faith, uh, fate or chance. It's not just happenstance. It, he, Paul realized, I don't have to try to control everything. That God, in fact, is in control of everything. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What do you believe? Mm -hmm. 
Do you rest in the knowledge that God will deliver you in whatever circumstances you may be facing Amen. because of his past great deliverance? Amen. Reliance upon God rather than our own naive ability is of fundamental importance, listen, in the Christian life, and yet such an attitude does not naturally come. Very often, suffering is needed to make us rely upon God. As I said earlier, sometimes suffering is needed to get our focus back on God. Sometimes we got to go through it in order to go ahead and fall on our face, fall on our knees, get our prayer life back right before a holy and righteous God. Stop relying on ourselves, relying on our parents, relying on our children's Bible study, relying on Big Mama, relying on the pastor, relying on the, your, your, your prayer group, relying on every and everything amen, instead of relying totally upon God. After the suffering and the scars of affliction, Paul gained an entirely different perspective on this thing called life. He testifies that God uses suffering and his scars to teach him life lessons of complete trust in God's deliverance. We often depend on our own skills and abilities when life seems easy. But we turn to God when we feel unable to help ourselves. Depending on God is a realization that of our own powerlessness. Mm -hmm. The writer of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, puts it this way. Let us draw near with a pure heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <coughs> Let us hold faith, the confession of our hope, without waiting. That's right. For he who promised is faithful. Amen. You see, God is our source of power. And we receive his help by staying in fellowship with him. I didn't say relationship, because relationship is not going to be broken. Those that I hold in my hand, Satan himself can't pluck them out. I said to you, I got three sons. They're all my sons. Listen, they can act ugly. They can get rebellious. They can walk away from church. They can walk away from the family. But they're still my sons. That's a relationship. It's a father and son relationship. Amen. Nothing can ever change that. It's a father and son relationship. But what can be strained, what can be broken, is not the relationship, but what? The fellowship. God is the source of our power, and we receive his help by staying in fellowship with him. It's a beautiful thing for me to have a relationship with my son, but I truly enjoy our fellowship together. Amen. I love when we break meal and break bread on Sunday evenings. I love when my grandbabies come over. Amen, amen, when we can play and have a good time. I love my granddaughters and everybody. I mean, my, 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 my daughter-in-law and everybody else, my sons. I love them all. But amen. But fellowship amen. means so much. Do you not know that God wants to fellowship with you? Sometimes the way we think we fellowship with God is during our devotional time. And that's fine. But we run in, we get a scripture, we read it through three or four or five times, and amen, we say a little prayer, and we're out of there. If my sons and their family would come over on Sunday, run in and eat and just leave, boom, we're out of there. No fellowship. <laughs> They're still my son, but I said, you know what, baby? I sure wish they would hang around just a little while. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have that problem. <laughs> I got to go home now. <laughs> it's all good. God is our source of power. Amen. And we receive his help by staying in fellowship with him. Amen. That's when I'm just, wherever I go, riding down the street, amen, walking down the street, in, on your job, I'm just having fellowship with God. Amen. It's not just about me talking to God, but it's me sensing wanting to hear from God himself right. into my heart, amen. into my life. Amen. With the attitude of dependence, problems will drive us to God rather than away from God. Amen. And then finally, our living hope is activated by what? our intensity of prayer. Mm. Intensity of prayer. Learning how to rely on God daily takes daily prayer. In verse 11, we find that Paul's deliverance, amen, was made possible because of the intense prayers of fellow believers. 
you also help together in prayers for me, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Amen. Paul expresses his fuller reliance upon God by admitting that he, he, he needed prayers of God's people on his behalf. Yes. How the intense prayers of the saints can, in some sense, move the hand of a sovereign God is beautiful and mysterious truth, as well as a gift that God gives. Even though, even through prayer, even though prayer is needed, and it is a mystery, it is stressed over and over again in the Word of God as a vital prerequisite, if you will, for the release and the moving of God's power. God sees it. God knows what's happening. God has the power to change, to deliver, to change things around, to prevent things. But God gets delight in the fact that we would pray to him and put our trust in him no matter what and put our hope in him. It moves God's hands in prayer. Human impotence casts itself at the feet of divine omnipotence only to rise again in God's power to accomplish his will. Yeah. Paul's deliverance resulted in the course of thanksgiving being lifted up to the throne of grace for the favor bestowed on all in the answer to those prayers. When the church unifies itself in intense prayers, God moves and then much thanksgiving can go up. God's deliverance was in response to Paul's faith as well as the faith of God's praying people. Paul knew that prayer availeth much before God. So now he requests prayers for himself and for his companion as they travel to spread the good news of the gospel. Amen. He remembered he had received the gift of living hope as others prayed for him. And now he was giving the gift back by praying intensely for other people. Listen, pray for your pastors, pray for teachers and missionaries and others who are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan is so busy and will challenge anyone making a real difference for Christ. If you're not making a difference for Christ, Satan will leave you alone. But once you stand up and declare that I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, no matter what, there's a big bullseye, there's a big target on you. And, what, and the saints of God ought to pray for the people who are out there trying to make a difference. So if you don't understand your difficulties, trust in God. Hmm. And ask Christians to pray intently for you. And as you yield to God, he will increase your faith and strengthen your prayer life. And grant you the gift of living hope. Difficulties should draw Christians closer together. And as we share our burdens and receive answers, we join our voices together to praise to a holy and righteous God for his great deliverance in our lives. The God of our living hope. Listen to the way Peter frames it in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It doesn't fade away. This living hope, 2,000 years ago, still has the same power today. It's reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you greatly rejoice, though not for a little while, if need be. Listen, even though they've been for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold, amen, than precious, listen, through, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, to honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is saying, no matter what you go through, when you stick with it and you keep hold of that living hope, no matter the trial, listen, at the end of the day, amen, after you test it, it will be praise and honor and glory, amen, as it's revealed in Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. In other words, as I go through what I go through, what God allows me to go through, when I stand strong and don't give in, listen, I may bend, but I won't break. Listen, no matter what I go through, on the other end, God receives the glory. God receives all the honor that I made it through. I don't, I don't talk about all the little strategies I have, all the little things I did to make things work out. No, 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 no. God 
God did it all by himself. To God be the glory. For he's done the great thing, and he's done it for me. Amen. Oh, I wish I was in a praising house today. Well, that, that's a good place to give God some praise. Because if you've ever been through something, and you've shown up been through, and you should have been dead, but you're still alive, but it was God that brought you through. It's God that made a way out of nowhere. It's God that found a way to fix something that was so terribly broken. God fixed it and put it all back together again. Amen. Some of you still seeing Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and put it back all together again. God did it all by himself. Amen. But let me hurry up and in closing, let me say this. God is honored when our lives are lived out in daily recognition that he is the only one that enables us to get through the day. I can't make it to 5 o'clock, Reverend Douglas, without God giving me strength to do it. Amen. Amen. If I leave it up to myself, I just will give up. Amen. Because so much stuff coming my way. But I know it's not just chance. I know it's just not faith. I know it's just not happenstance that this happened to me. No, 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 no. And it wasn't something I, I can control and keep it up. No, 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 no. God allowed it. But I put my hope and my trust and my faith in him. And he enables me to get through the day. When our lives are devoted to the need to rely on God, we realize that what is out of control in our lives is under control with God. What's out of control in our lives, the, the ugliness and the nastiness and all the hurt and the pain, all that stuff is out of just that chaos. When I give it to God, it's all in control. It's in good hands. God uses our scars from our time of despair to tell a story of his love and his faithfulness to other people. All right. Other people see what you've been through. They say, how did you come out? Look at you. You look better now than you did before you went into trouble. It's a story. Sit down. Let me tell you about a story. It's about love and it's about faithfulness about the God we serve. You see, scars are not finish lines of death. They are checkpoints of life. Scars are not finish lines of death. They are checkpoints of life. One of the problems we have in the Christian community is that we are afraid to talk about our scars. Hmm. We feel like we are past the point of help, so we don't even want to talk about it. We feel like failures in some sense, so we don't want to talk about it. We feel like we have let God down and we don't want to talk about it because our lives are marked with scars. Scars are not a sign of weakness. They're a sign of survival. I got a big cut on my left leg, yeah, man, when my leg was open up when I was a little boy. And I remember young wearing shorts around the house. My sons would ask, Daddy, what happened to you right there? Why? They see the big scar that's on my leg. Well, that's a story right there. I could have lost that leg, but God brought me through, and I still walk around today. Still run, can out swim you, and everything else I can want to do. Amen. I'm talking pretty big up in there. Hope they don't challenge me when I get home. <laughs> I do feel my back starting to hurt this little bit. <laughs> Scars are not a sign of weakness. They are a sign of survival. There are some people that will tell you that you really can't be a follower of Jesus Christ if there's weak areas in your life. Let me tell you, that's a lie right out of the bowels of hell. There are folk that will tell you that if you were truly a child of God, you wouldn't have to be dealing with these weak areas in your life. No, 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 no. People will tell you that you can't be saved and born again and baptized. Listen, if you're dealing with weak areas in your life. However, I have personally seen God do amazing things in many people's lives who have learned to trust him Amen. through their times Amen. and their periods of weakness. He has softened my own heart toward hurting people. And much of that compassion was learned through my own times of despair. Mm -hmm. He has brought people into my life that were on the edge of despair. So that by sharing my story of love and faithfulness of God with them, they would find someone that fully understood 
Now, I want you to understand something. I wish I had never experienced those difficult mm -hmm. times in my life. Amen. Well, as I stand on the other side, if I can look back and I can shout and I can praise God, but I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. When I was in the midst of the fiery furnace, it hurt. Yes. Can I tell it like it is? Yeah. It hurt like crazy. Yeah. I wanted it over with. But now that I've come through on the other side, I've learned that that fiery furnace was a necessary incident and period in my life. I understand today that God allowed it in my life to remind me of his faithfulness and his love and security even when I don't feel very secure. So what about you today? Do you have scars in your life? Do you have pain? Do you have hurts and feelings that you just don't understand and you just don't like? What are you going to do today about them? How are you going to allow them to shape you? You see, scars and suffering and afflictions shapes our lives, whether we realize it or not. Because God allows it to shape us. But it's up to us to determine how it will ultimately shape us. There are three possible ways that scars shape us. Scars can paralyze you. Scars can make you bitter. Or scars can strengthen you. Paralyze you. Make you bitter. Or they can strengthen you. Some of you have been through a lot of stuff in your life. And you've given up on life because of it. Because you look back at the scars. And you see, see, God failed me and I failed myself. And you've given up on life. You've given up on the church. You've given up on the word of God. And you're paralyzed. And you may not admit it, but you're bitter. You're bitter. You're bitter. You need to allow those scars to strengthen you. Scars strengthen you when you embrace them. Yes, I've been through it, but I'm standing on the other side. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in need, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sakes. For when I'm weak, when I'm weak, when I'm having my weak moments, I know better, but I didn't do better. In my moment of weakness, when I'm weak, then I'm made strong. Are you willing to let God take your scars and use them to bring honor and glory to him? Are you willing to allow him to control the areas of your life that are just so out of control? Maybe today you need someone just to pray with you and pray for you. Maybe you simply need someone to listen to you and to help you embrace your scars. Let me close this down with 1 Peter 5 and 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. No matter the intensity of your despair, Place your trust, your hope in a God who answers prayer and call upon his holy name today.